speedy recovery to dr ak singh sir um, now uh, the topic for this discussion is on emperor preserve study the implications for empowering heart failure care across the risk spectrum and heart failure as as we know it has been recognized as the frequent gotten often fatal killer in type 2 diabetes it's it's a forgotten complication often uh, more so if we talk of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction this has been recognized as the achilles heel in cardiovascular medicine overall with uh, very with uh, being a very heterogeneous entity with very few uh, options of modifying the disease uh, outcomes now like atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease the risk of heart failure also is higher in the south asian uh, patients we if we look at this recent evidence from the uk biobank prospective cohort study we see an 83% higher risk of heart failure independently of other risk factors in the south asian ancestors as compared to europeans at the same time the risk of atrial fibrillation or flutter as a complication or comorbidity which exists with heart failure is relatively lower in our south asian patients by 24% in diabetes specifically the importance of diabetic cardiomyopathy and the influence of metabolic derangements insulin resistance and over dependence on fatty acid metabolism gives rise to early diastolic dysfunction this this aspect has been well recognized and this diastolic dysfunction and diastolic heart failure may be occurring independently of coronary artery disease in type 2 diabetes and they, these may be early early effects early pathophysiological effects and complications diastolic dysfunction may further progress to systolic dysfunction as well as diastolic uh, combined dysfunction uh, and with the development of microvascular or macrovascular coronary artery disease frank heart failure development is possible in the later stage what is the prevalence of diastolic dysfunction left ventricular diastolic dysfunction typically quite commonly observed in echocardiography findings uh, this recently published meta analysis looks at 27 such studies performed in patients with type 2 diabetes and it was observed that 46% of patients with type 2 diabetes overall have some evidence of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction there there is heterogeneity in in community based studies the prevalence may be around 1 in 3 patients with type 2 diabetes whereas in the hospital setting it may be observed in nearly half of the patients with type 2 diabetes now if we look at a prototype case the type of case that we are dealing uh, with in the emperor preserve study a prototype case who is a 67 year old female who came for routine follow up the patient is a known case of hypertension a uh, long standing hypertension of 15 years and diabetes in 7 years the patient did not present any obvious complaint but on probing, probing the patient suggests of progressively increasing breathlessness on routine activity and the uh, patient also spoke about episodes of rapid heartbeat the patient is an overweight patient with borderline high blood pressure uh, with long standing hypertension the blood pressure is managed with the current systolic bp of 130 and diastolic being 88 mmhg the pulse is 80 beats per minute and normal the patient's hp1c is 8% ecg the ecg findings are suggestive of lv hypertrophy enlargement of the left atrium and the ecg suggests normal sinus rhythm patient also has microalbuminuria and egfr of 59 mls per minute per 1.7 meter square suggestive of chronic kidney disease now for such patients um, if we look at evidence um, of patients with type 2 diabetes who are above 60 years of age quite a few patients may have undiagnosed heart failure if we go by the guideline definitions of heart failure and here this evidence published in the year 2012 this looks at 581 patients with type 2 diabetes who are above 60 years of age in these patients 161 of them had undiagnosed heart failure which represents 28% of patients over 60 years of age and in this 28% 23% is represented by heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and nearly 5% by heart failure with reduced ejection fraction heart failure with reduced ejection fraction one would expect that it is diagnosed more more commonly and unlike heart failure with preserved ejection fraction which remains undiagnosed now for making the diagnosis of heart failure if you look at the guidelines of the european society of cardiology the recent update published in august 2021 the guidelines require presence of symptoms or signs suggestive of heart failure 
and an objective evidence of cardiac dysfunction. So this objective evidence of cardiac dysfunction is a mandatory requirement for making the diagnosis of heart failure. The typical symptoms or signs are well known. When we talk of evidence of cardiac dysfunction as measured by cardiological assessments, apart from routine electrocardiography, transthoracic echocardiography is recognized as the key assessment to make the diagnosis of heart failure. Chest X-ray can give an objective evidence and natiuretic peptide assessment if available, primarily to differentiate the different causes of breathlessness, whether it is related to heart failure or to uh, other, other causes of breathlessness. Now, natiuretic peptides can, uh, there, there can be a caveat here, uh, specifically when we talk of diastolic heart failure. The secretion of natiuretic peptides depends on the tension within the uh, cardiac chambers and the tension is directly proportional to the size of the cardiac chambers and inversely proportional to the thickness by the Laplace's law. Now, in diastolic heart failure, the thickness of the chambers may be more because of stiffness and the size may be smaller. So natiuretic peptide levels may be lower in such patients and in about 20% of cases with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, natiuretic peptide levels may be normal. So these uh, uh, lower or normal natiuretic peptide assessment may not be indicative of absence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and echocardiography is the assessment to rely on. Uh, the algorithm which is recommended by the European Society of Cardiology for diagnosis of heart failure, once echocardiography is done, based on the ejection fraction, the patient should be classified into three phenotypes, either patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, wherein the ejection fraction is less than or equal to 40%, or heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with greater than or equal to 50% LVEF. Now, if we look at these two different phenotypes, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, vis-a-vis -vis reduced ejection fraction, and look at the clinical characteristics, Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction typically represents elderly population and more with more female predisposition, unlike heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Hypertension and diabetes are very strongly associated with HFPEF. Coronary artery disease, on the other hand, is very strongly associated with HFREF. And comorbidities like atrial fibrillation are also commonly uh, observed in patients with HFPEF. Diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as we discussed, would rely strongly on echocardiological -cardio abnormalities of left ventricular diastolic function or filling pressures. And none of these parameters are recommended as gold standard assessments, but the more the number of abnormalities, either in the left ventricular structure, like in increased left ventricular mass or left atrial volume or uh, the relative wall thickness, or in terms of diastolic dysfunction, like E by E prime ratio or pulmonary artery systolic pressure, the more the number of abnormalities present, the more the likelihood uh, of the patient having heart failure with preserved dejection fracture. Now, coming to the treatment part of heart failure, as far as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is concerned, there, there are several medicines which are foundational therapies with very strong recommendation from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines now. We can see here that in in this HFREF population, even dapagliflozin and empagliflozin are recommended with class 1 level A evidence-based recommendation as foundational therapies. Heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is an intermediate entity. Here, again, um, apart from the use of diuretics for symptomatic relief, which is strongly recommended, the other treatments like ACE inhibitors or ARBs or beta blockers, MRAs or ARNI, these only have class 2B recommendation because uh, the evidence is not very strong for these patients. And if we look at heart failure with the detection fraction, this, this, these guidelines are based on evidence up to April 2021. They are not yet updated post the results of Emperor Preserve study. So up to this point, only the uh, treatment of comorbidities, non-cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular non comorbidities, as a class one recommendation and the use of diuretics as a class one recommendation for symptomatic relief. There is no disease modifying therapy recommended in the guidelines based on the available evidence for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In that context, if we look at evidence with HGLT2 inhibitors for their various mechanisms for heart failure, apart from reduction in preload and afterload, direct effects at the level of myocardium, which uh, may improve the myocardial mitochondrial metabolism, oxygen demand supply balance, 
and inflammatory changes in the myocardium. These have demonstrated improvements in diastolic function as well as structure of the left ventricle. Uh, with this understanding, if we look at the design of Emperor Pickle study, it's a phase three randomized control trial for patients with heart failure and ejection fraction of above 40%. Patients with or without type 2 diabetes were represented in the study, and the patients had an EGFR of up to 20 mils per minute per 1.73 meter square. Close to 6,000 patients were randomized in two groups of empagliflozin and 10 mg or placebo and followed up for 26 months. The study was designed to evaluate the primary outcome of cardiovascular death or hospitalizations. A closer look into the inclusion criteria. The study represents patients with ejection fraction of above 40%, elevated anti-pro BNP levels, and either structural changes in the heart, structural remodeling and hypertrophy changes, or a prior hospitalization event for heart failure within the last 12 months. And this does not represent acute decompensated heart failure episode. It represents chronic heart failure stages. Patients with any CV event within 90 days were also excluded from the analysis. So this, uh, looking at the demographics and clinical characteristics, the average age of the population was 72 years. Women represented 45% of the population. Asians represented 14%, which includes 100 patients from India as well. And uh, by the LV ejection fraction, patients in the mildly reduced range of 40 to 50% ejection fraction comprised of one third of the population. Those between 50 to 60 percent ejection fraction comprised of another one third, and those with ejection fraction of above 60 percent high ejection fraction, these also comprised of one third of the study population. So it was a stratified randomization method. Um, about half of the study population did not have type 2 diabetes, half of the patients had atrial fibrillation, and more than 90 percent of the patients had hypertension. CKD was also evident in about half of the study population. Now, looking at the study outcomes, over 26 months of median follow-up, we see a 21% relative risk reduction for CV death or heart failure hospitalization favoring empagliflozin. And uh, in terms of absolute risk reduction, this represents 31 patients to be treated with empagliflozin on top of the disease, um, the uh, therapies for um, risk factor control to prevent one additional CV death or heart failure hospitalization over 26 months. There were 16 pre-specified subgroup analysis and none of these subgroups showed any heterogeneity of the results. The results were consistent across all the pre-specified subgroups. Here we can see in males as well as females, the results were consistent. And uh, in patients with or without diabetes, the results were consistent. So also in patients with or without CKD. According to ejection fraction, baseline ejection fraction, the results were overall consistent. Uh, however, when the ejection fraction goes above 60%, the effect tends to fade a little, uh, just looking at the point estimates here. In patients, regardless of atrial fibrillation, with or without atrial fibrillation, the results were consistent in favor of MPG. Total heart failure hospitalization events also showed relative risk reduction of 27% with early benefits uh, evident with empagliflozin. And if you look at hospitalizations that required AV diuretic therapy, there was a relative risk reduction of 33% with uh, empagliflozin. Hospitalizations requiring IV diuretics represents patients admitted with congested state uh, and worsening of heart failure. In terms of slow EGFR, that is uh, the decline, natural decline of kidney function, empagliflozin was also able to slow the natural decline of kidney function by 1.36 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square annually. Now, looking at the individual components of primary outcome, heart failure hospitalizations and CV death, the results were primarily driven by 29% risk reduction for heart failure hospitalizations. CV death, on the other hand, had a modest nominal reduction of 9%. And if you look at different mortality outcomes here, uh, uh, cardiovascular deaths, 7.3% of patients on EMPA versus 8.2% patients on placebo had a CV death given. Looking specifically at heart failure-related death, sudden cardiac deaths were evident in 3.3% patients on EMPA vis-a-vis 3.8% on placebo. And heart failure worsening was evident in 1.3% patients on EMPA versus 1.7% patients on placebo. Overall mortality was quite high. It was almost twice that of CV death. And despite being a heart failure population, non-cardiovascular causes of death were high in this population because this is what is typically observed in 
patients with heart failure and preserved dejection fraction with an average age as high as 72 years non non cv causes also play an important part in overall mortality the improvement in symptomatic score of nyha class shift this benefit was evident right from the 12th week the patients in nyha class 3 shifted to nyha class 2 and class 2 to class 1 right from the 12th week onwards uh, and uh, this benefit the odds were 20 to 40 percent higher with empagliflozin worsening of nyha class on the other hand was 20 to 40 percent lesser with empagliflozin as compared to placebo in terms of overall safety there were no imbalances uh, across the patient groups um, specifically hypotension was evident in about 2% more patients on empagliflozin as compared to placebo and being an elderly population with an average age of 72 years this adverse event may manifest a little more uh, symptomatic hypotension urinary tract infections were seen in 9.9% patients on empa versus 8.1% on placebo and genital infections as as evident 2.2% patients on empa versus 0.7% patients on placebo Ketoacidosis, there were no imbalances, four events on empagliflozin and five events in the placebo group and hypoglycemic events also did not show any imbalance. Even in patients without diabetes, 0.7% versus 0.8% of the patients had hypoglycemic events, which does not suggest, suggest of increased hypoglycemia or ketoacidosis risk in patients without diabetes. So looking at the overall picture of heart failure with preserved direction traction, we saw that the guidelines don't recommend any therapy as a disease-modifying treatment option for this population. And various trials which have been conducted over the years, including the beta blocker trials, ACE inhibitor, sorry, ARB trials, ACE inhibitor trials, and spironolactone and sacubitril valsartan studies over almost two decades. These studies were very differently designed because of the evolving understanding of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We can see that the primary endpoints are also very different and unique across the trials. But amongst all these studies attempted to evaluate benefit in HEFPEF population, Emperor Preserved represents the first and only study to have shown a significant benefit for the primary endpoint, both in terms of magnitude of risk reduction of 21% and in terms of statistical significance. This is the first and ev only evidence till date. And if we look at the other study of empagliflozin, which was performed in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, across this entire continuum of ejection fraction now taken together, um, patients with heart failure and reduced, mildly reduced, and preserved ejection fraction, all the patients taken together. And thus, if we look at the spectrum of ejection fraction and the effect of empagliflozin on CV death or hospitalizations for heart failure, we see very consistent effects throughout the spectrum. Except for this group, wherein the ejection fraction goes above 65%, the overall hazard ratio is 0.98. Although the p-value for interaction does not suggest any heterogeneity, but uh, this is based on that's because this is based on fewer events. But uh, possibly, when the ejection fraction is more than normal, probably this might also represent different phenotype of patients with small chamber sizes because of amyloidosis or high, genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this this uh, point needs to be explored better. But up to Patients with ejection fraction of up to 64%, the evidence was very consistent across uh, all these patient groups for heart failure outcomes. And so if you look at the entire picture of uh, empagliflozin, right from patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, specifically in the type 2 diabetes glycemia control studies of uh, phase 3, uh, which represent low to medium severe risk population, the empareg outcome study population without prior events, Empiric outcome population with prior MI or stroke. The Emperor Preserved study uh, representing HEF-PEF population regardless of type 2 diabetes and the Emperor Reduced study representing HEF-REF population regardless of diabetes. Uh, across this entire spectrum of risk, we see consistent risk reduction with empagliflozin, which is statistically significant throughout for CV death or heart failure hospitalization. Relatively, the risk reduction decreases as the overall risk of the patient increases, but in terms of absolute benefit, the number of patients needed to treat to prevent one additional event uh, on an annualized basis, this improves from 189 in the lowest risk group to as low as 19 patients in the highest risk category. So uh, to summarize the um, um, uh, session, diastolic heart failure is an important and undiagnosed or underdiagnosed disease. A proactive suspicion 
in the patients who are predisposed to develop heart failure with reserve ejection fraction could be an essential first step emperor preserved study is the first conclusive evidence of benefit with any intervention as a treatment option for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction now benefits of empagliflozin across the spectrum of heart failure care are proven and independent of the diabetes status of the patients the patients without diabetes have responded equally well as far as the heart failure outcomes are concerned and a patient centric approach must underscore a good clinical decision making so i'll stop presenting here and it over to our judges please